Christ is risen. Christ is risen. We've been uh, singing hallelujahs all morning. It's Easter Sunday in Eastminster United Church in Belleville, Ontario. We've heard the Easter story read for us again. We've also shared a psalm, and in that psalm there is one verse in particular that I'm going to encourage you to, to think about, to reflect with me on these words of Scripture. The psalmist wrote, What shall I render to the Lord for all the blessings I have received? What shall I render to the Lord for all the blessings I have received? Let's pray together. We pray, O oh God, that as we spend this little while reflecting on the story of Easter, reflecting on these words of ancient text, that we might, by your grace, be so open to your presence, be listening so profoundly, experience your presence so intimately, that whatever words are spoken now, the word we hear will be yours. Amen. Did you know that there is a fable which connects the robin with the crucifixion of our Lord? It's just a fable, but like all good myth, it can still be full of truth. Originally, you may not know this, the robin was a plain brown bird, and it remained so until the first Good Friday. On that dark day, the little creature saw a man nailed to a cross, slowly dying, all alone with no one to help him. The bird felt pity for the man and tried to ease his suffering. It lit on the ring of thorns which had been forced on his head. And it pulled and pulled until one of those thorns came free. And then it tried another and another, concentrating and using every bit of its strength to remove those sharp points of pain which only increased the master's suffering. In doing so, one of the thorns stuck the bird so that its own blood mixed with that of the man's. And as it hopped about, pulling thorns, the red blood smeared its feathers, and that is why to this very day, the robin has a red breast. When you hear about Good Friday, when, as we've been doing this week again, when you think about what happened in the last hours of Jesus' life, how he was prosecuted, persecuted, lacerated, despised, rejected, and executed, when you dare to believe that he was willing to endure such suffering and death in order to somehow benefit people like you and me, don't you wish there was something you could do about it? Kind of like that little bird. Don't you wish that there was something you could do about it. None of us can change what happened. We're not going to rewrite history. But don't you wish there was some meaningful way that, that you could acknowledge that extraordinary gift? Don't you find yourself praying like the psalmist or at least wanting to pray, how can I repay you, God? How can I repay you? In his book, Make a Difference, Responding to God's Call to Love the World, Melvin Cheatham describes how he was offered just such a gift by somebody else. When Cheatham worked as a medical missionary during the war in Bosnia, he was assisted by a local surgeon, a Dr. Josip Jurisic. One of their patients, a soldier of the Bosnian Muslim army, had been shot through the neck. When Cheatham operated to remove the bullet, he discovered that it had severed the spinal column so that the man would be totally paralyzed. Cheatham left the tube in his airway, connected him to a ventilator to assist with his breathing. Since the hospital's electricity was intermittent at best, the ventilator was connected to a diesel generator. When Cheatham arrived the next morning to check on his patient, Dr. Eurisic took him aside and said, during the night the diesel fuel ran out, the generator quit working, the ventilator stopped, the man couldn't breathe on his own, he died. Now, Cheatham was frustrated, naturally, frustrated by the circumstances, but he really wasn't surprised that such a fragile patient would die. What Eurisic said next did surprise, even shock him. Eurisic said, Professor, because it was you who operated on the soldier and he died, I fear his people will come for you and they'll kill you. Therefore, I've changed the medical record. I've erased your name as the surgeon and I've written my name in place of yours. The sudden dryness of his throat and lump which formed there prevented Cheatham from speaking for a few moments. When he could, he said, but surely, friend, that, that means they'll come for you. That means they'll kill you. And Dr. Jurassic quietly replied, you can leave this place of war, 
I cannot. I am prepared to die in your place if I must in order that you can live. I know that some folks hear the Good Friday story and they treat it like a puzzle to be solved or a mystery to be questioned. They want to analyze the historic record and argue the theological implications. If, however, you choose instead to simply believe that the death of Jesus somehow saves us from the consequences of our own shortcomings and mistakes, then you have got to know how Melvin Cheatham felt that day in Bosnia. And don't you want to pray? How can I repay you? The short answer is, you can't, I can't, we can't. There are some debts which simply cannot be repaid. Cheatham could never repay Dr. Urasic's willingness to die in his place. Any more than an organ transplant recipient can repay the life-giving generosity of the donor. Ask Helen Campbell and her family what they, what they could ever do to repay the person who donated the lungs which she received on Friday? Or, or how can we adequately repay our parents? During the first three years of my life, now I don't remember the details, but I was told about them often enough, my appendix ruptured, I pulled a pot of boiling water on top of myself, my arm was squashed in the ringer of an old washing machine up to the shoulder, and I contracted polio. How could I even begin to repay my parents for the worrying anguish they suffered or the tireless caring they gave me? Betty and I thank God that our own children were not nearly so hard on us, although each of them has caused a few sleepless nights. And, and have you seen, of course some of our folks here know, the statistics on how much it costs to raise a child. Parents agree, however, that whatever price we pay for loving our children is a debt for which repayment is neither expected nor is it even possible. Besides, our children pay enough when they have children of their own. Even before that extraordinary gift of God, which was the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, the psalmist was overwhelmed with a sense of unpayable indebtedness. He wrote, what shall I render to the Lord? How can I repay you, God? On this Easter Sunday, with the story of resurrection, the promise of redemption ringing in our ears, though the debt may be unpayable, surely there is something that we can render to the Lord for all the blessings we have received. Well, for one thing, we can accept them. We can accept the blessings we've been given. I read that a few years ago, NASA engineers built a cannon that fired dead chickens at the windshields of airplanes to test their strength for withstanding collisions with birds in the air. British engineers needed to test the windscreens of a new generation of high-speed trains, so they asked to borrow that cannon. Arrangements were made, tests were organized, but the British scientists were disappointed, even shocked when the first dead chicken went right through the fortified windshield. They tried again and again with the same result. And knowing that the windshields tested by NASA had survived the testing, they contacted the Americans to check if maybe they were doing something wrong. Maybe they were using the cannon incorrectly. After comparing notes, the NASA engineers sent this one-line memo. Thaw the chicken. Kind of spoils your appetite for turkey later on, doesn't it? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we suffer circumstances which cannot be avoided, cannot be changed, of course. But there are other times when we try and we try and we try and it gets no easier and it feels no better, when all the while, all the while we're trying, there are blessings of help and comfort and relief just waiting to be claimed. All we have to do, I guess, is thaw the chicken, so to speak. All we have to do, 
All we have to do in those circumstances is, is stop pushing against the door and turn toward the door that God has already opened. All we have to do is stop pretending that we're strong enough and take the help of those with whom God has surrounded us. All we have to do is stop trying to, to change difficult people and pray instead for grace to love them. All we have to do is stop trying to, to win the battles which God has already won for us. We can never repay God for all the blessings we have known, but at least, surely, at least, we can accept them. And we can appreciate the blessings that we've been given. Probably the most memorable thing that happened in the infamous summer of 69 was the first man landing on the moon. And one of the many memorable aspects of that achievement was the response of one of the astronauts. This is, this is kind of written into our lore of the modern era. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had been chosen to ride the lunar module to the moon's surface. Aldrin decided that when they safely landed, he was going to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, uh, the same act of worship which we shared here last Sunday and, and again on Monday, Thursday. Here's part of Aldrin's recollection of what happened on that incredible day. He writes, We awoke at 10.40 Houston time in the morning. Neil and I separated from Mike Collins in the command module. Our power descent was right on schedule. With only seconds worth of fuel left, we touched down at 3.30 p.m. Now is the moment for communion, so I unstowed the elements in their flight packets. I put them and the scripture reading on the little table in front of the abort guidance system computer. Then I call back to Houston. Houston, this is Eagle. This is LM Pilot speaking. I'd like to request a few moments of silence. I would like to invite each person listening in, wherever and whoever he may be, to contemplate for a few moments the events of the past few hours, and to give thanks in his own individual way. To give thanks in his own individual way. Well, well that circumstance was unique. It was extraordinary, of course. But, but it's really commonplace for, for all of us to associate gratitude with moments of, of high accomplishment. Gratitude comes easily when our, when our circumstances reflect the joy of an Easter morning. But, but what about those times? You know what times I'm talking about. What about those times when we feel stuck in Friday? For instance, for instance, it's easy to thank God for the safe birth of a healthy infant. But thanks may not come quite so easily a few months later when we're up to our elbows in the stench of a dirty diaper. <laughs> Speaking from experience, well, not a lot of experience. I, Betty's not here, but I still have to be honest. But thanks may not come so easily when we're up to the elbows in the stench of a dirty diaper, but... But even though we may not feel grateful, even though we may not want to give thanks, even though, don't you know, that the very thing that turns the stomach is proof that all the, the physiological systems in that precious child are working properly? We may not be able to repay God for all our blessings, but we should surely accept them with appreciation. And at least one other thing we can do, we can amplify those blessings, the blessings we've been given. Think about it. This is the discipleship part. This is, this is when we acknowledge that it's not enough for us to simply receive, to simply accept, even to be grateful, but, but we're supposed to do something. None of our blessings was intended to end with us. Every gift, every talent, every opportunity is given with purpose. And that purpose is found in how we use our blessings, how we give and share them for the benefit of others. We cannot repay God for the blessings we've been given, but we can amplify them. As the Apostle John wrote in one of his letters, if God loves us this much, 
we are bound to love one another. One of my blessings was to have been at Emmanuel College in Toronto during the time when the Reverend Dr. Earl Lautenschlager was principal. Now, he wasn't a particularly effective administrator, but he was an extraordinary combination of pastor and teacher. He was also an in-your-face communicator who enjoyed making outlandish statements and enjoyed even more the results. For example, I attended one year the banquet for the graduating class of theological students, most of whom would soon be ordained. Launschlager announced to that gathering that many of today's ministers remind me of a poodle. And he went on to describe a poodle that, that belonged to a former parishioner, a poodle that was precious to that former parishioner, so precious she adored the animal and lavished it with every kind of canine indulgence, including a very expensive collar studded with precious stones. And then he said, one day that woman went with her family to the African Lion Safari, west of Toronto. And you may know that the, the animals roam free while visitors travel through their domain with the car. Despite warnings to keep the windows closed, the heat of the day persuaded one of the family to roll down his window just enough to allow that poodle to jump out. And before anyone could react, a lion snapped awake and gobbled it up. Launschlager said, and enjoyed saying, that the only part of that creature that survived was its collar, which reappeared a few days later. He said, just like so many ministers in this day and age, when they find themselves in the real world, the only thing that's good for anything, the only thing that survives, is the collar. <laughs> the stories of Holy Week describe real world events in the life of Jesus. Events that led to a cross at a place called Golgotha. But we're here today to celebrate that they didn't end there. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. The stories brought us all the way to an empty grave. Death could not hold him. Death could not have the last word. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. And our own lives are comprised of real world experiences, experiences which, well, you know, those experiences can weigh on us as hard as the heaviest cross, sometimes even causing us to want to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But, but by the grace of God, and that's what we're celebrating today, by the grace of God, there is more to us than the callers. There is more to us than our circumstances. There is more to us than our difficulties. There is more to us even than our convictions. Because by the grace of God, in this real world, we are an Easter people who have been to the grave and found it empty. And that empty grave is the ultimate proof of our blessedness, that by the grace of God, our own stories need not end with our disappointments. They need not end with our defeats. They need not end with our mistakes. They need not end with despair. They need not end even with death in any of its disguises. And our blessedness need not end with us, should not end with us, must not end with us. We may not be able to repay God for the blessings that we've been given, but by God we can accept them and we can acknowledge them with appreciation and we can amplify that blessedness by being, by being blessings. Even the blessing of God for everyone we meet. You know you want to do it, you know you need to do it. And you know you can do it. Because Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Amen.